Good morning again. It's uh, really a great pleasure to introduce this panel on key voices in development. My good friend Juma Mwapachu, who is the former Secretary General of the East African Community, is going to moderate this very interesting conversation with Rebecca Greenspan, who's the former Vice President of Costa Rica, but is currently the Associate Administrator for the United Nations Development Program and is also an Under Secretary General of the United Nations, along with uh, President Donald Kabaruka, who is the President of the African Development Bank and is well known to many of us as a very successful finance minister of Rwanda. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to my friend Juma. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for being here. I think we are going to have a very lively opening uh, plenary. Um, voices uh, from the uh, leadership in development. Um, and of course, uh, we do have a very distinguished uh, uh, panel uh, before you. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Juma Mwapachu. I'm the immediate uh, uh, former Secretary General of the East African Community, but I've also served uh, my country, Tanzania, as ambassador uh, to France, and I think you read uh, the rest of my bio in the uh, conference booklet, which you have. Um, but let me introduce you uh, to the panel uh, before I say one or two words. Uh, we do have uh, before you, uh, first of all, uh, Rebecca uh, Greenspan. Uh, Rebecca is a um, native of Costa Rica. Um, she has been vice president of our country. Uh, she now uh, works with the United Nations um, in the UNDP, where she is the deputy administrator uh, and an under secretary general of the United Nations. Uh, Rebecca uh, took her degree in economics from Costa Rica, uh, but she also uh, did her master's of science in economics from a leading uh, British university. I don't know whether Richard Jolly is here. Um, uh, she's an alma mater of the University of Sussex uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, my friend uh, Donald Kaberuka um, is a Tanzanian in a way for which I'm very proud. Uh, but a Rwandese uh, uh, by nationality. Uh, he grew up in Tanzania because of the accidents of history in Africa. Um, his parents uh, were in exile uh, in Tanzania for many years, uh, so uh, went through most of his education uh, in Tanzania. But after that um, ugly um, genocide, um, he was able to go back to his native country, uh, where he served in the Central Bank uh, as Deputy Governor, uh, and later became the Minister for Finance, um, and overseeing uh, a very remarkable uh, transformation uh, of that country uh, to the stage where today in Africa, uh, we pride ourselves uh, of Rwanda being you know, one of the most uh, robust uh, economic uh, models uh, in, in, in Africa. And, and of course, um, uh, uh, Donald uh, was very much uh, 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 the architect uh, of that economic transformation. Uh, he is now, or since 2005, the president uh, of the African Development Bank. Um, he studied at the University of Dar es Salaam, which is my alma mater, uh, took his degree in economics from there, and later went to the University of Glasgow in Scotland, uh, where, he's, where he obtained his doctorate uh, in economics. So you can understand that we do have a formidable uh, panel uh, before you, uh, and I think we will have a very lively uh, conversation. So let me begin uh, by um, asking um, both of them a very general question. Um, <clears throat> over the last 40 years, uh, Rebecca and Donald, uh, we have seen uh, within the global uh, society uh, a number of commissions uh, looking at North-South relations, looking at how we can build a more just and a more humane 
uh, global society. Uh, what Richard Jolly and his colleagues uh, in the 70s and 80s uh, described development, described it as a development of the human face. Uh, so we, we went through the Pearson Commission, we went through the Brandt Commission, uh, the Brundtland Commission in terms of the environment and uh, climate justice. Uh, we went through the South Commission, uh, which was chaired by the founding father uh, of Tanzania, uh, Mwaling Julius Nyerere. And of course, uh, we can also speak a lot about um, our dear friend, um, the late Mahbubulha, uh, a very strong uh, member of SID, uh, who started the Human Development Reports. Around all these commissions and all these reports has really been this uh, ethos about how to bridge the gulf uh, between the rich and poor and how to alleviate uh, poverty uh, and make uh, uh, international cooperation uh, realize the objectives uh, of realizing uh, a social justice in the world today. But 40 years down the line, uh, uh, Dr. Greenspan, do we, what is the balance sheet? What, what do you think is the balance sheet? Have these commissions, uh, these all ideas delivered, uh, or do you think that is still work in progress? Well, I, I really think that a lot has been achieved, and uh, what we are seeing right now with the, the emerging South, and the Global South, the emerging Africa continent that we were talking about, the, uh, the improvement and, and progress made on the Millennium Development Goals, uh, even in Sub-Saharan Africa, we are seeing, uh, despite uh, many of the challenges, some progress in many of the Millennium Development Goals. So I think that a lot of progress has been done and has been achieved. But I, I would say that the main thing that is happening right now, because we, I think that the, we, we are shifting uh, in, uh, in what we are seeing in the world, the main thing that is happening is that many of the ideas that we're competing in terms of development because uh, uh, there have been always been competing ideas in terms of development, not only one part of that. <laughs> but what is happening now that is different from the past is that those competing ideas have more power to be put on the table as options and getting away from one size fits all type of policies. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is because you are seeing a, a, the emergence of new paths to development that are successful, that are coming from the South. So part of what is happening now is that there are more options in the table for the developing world that are being a, a power, powerfully a put forward because of the success of many of the countries of the South. So the matrix of options that are, open up, are, are opening up to the developing world are a, much more than they were in the past, where there was pretty much a very strong one paradigm type of, of view. So in terms of the, those of us that have been in the development field for a long time, this is a very good news because it's precisely in the discussion and the specificity and the diversity of the policy options in, in front of countries that will lie really the, uh, 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 the richness of the possibilities for the future. And I think that the emergence of the Global South is making that much more forcefully today than it was in the past. Well, thank you, thank you Rebecca. The Global South, I mean, if you read the challenge to the South, uh, which is the report of the South Commission, um, mm -hmm. you do, of course, get that sense of competing ideas, um, ideas that, um, uh, uh, that are founded on a northern perspective uh, about how to address issues of development in the world, and particularly in the Global South, but also ideas from the South itself you know, about what really can drive uh, economic uh, growth uh, and, 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 and development. Dr. Kaberuka, uh, what, what perspective can you offer uh, on this uh, aspect? Juma, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to, to this uh, August uh, audience. Uh, and, and the balance sheet has assets and liabilities. 
Let us begin with the assets. I think uh, Dr. Greenspan is quite right. We have come a long way. We have come a long way. The world at the time of the Land Commission today is a different world. Maybe Africa is converging much more slowly than the rest of the world. Uh, but if you look at Latin America, then financial crisis, Asia, the Asian drama, Africa, today is a different world. Now, it's a result of a combination of internal and external dynamics, obviously. However, uh, this is the, uh, the liability side. If you look today at what is happening in the Horn of Africa, in the Horn of Africa, you could say, here is a test of where we have gone wrong. Because uh, it cannot be that at the time when the world is making so much progress, we could see starvation in the 21st century. And uh, Amatya Sen told us many years ago that uh, you could blame Mother Nature for the droughts, but you could not blame Mother Nature for the famine. Famine is a mad-made policy failure issue. And so for me, that could have children today dying for lack of food, I think is an indictment on all of us. But I could go further and go to the Arab world, what is going on in the Arab world at this moment. Uh, Tunisia, where I live, uh, was registering 7% growth. It was uh, attracting investments. International organizations, including ourselves, were praising this regime as delivering the goods of the country you are describing. I think for me, two things emanate from the Tunisian experience and the Arab Spring. One of them is that this thing called uh, authoritarian bargains, that somehow you can deliver development and then democracy will come for another day. Forget it, it's a myth. That is one. The idea that you could have bread before freedom I think the youth of Tunisia who defied winter in January 2011 have made a point. And therefore, we have come a long way in terms of growth, in terms of uh, the kind of economic numbers you know very well, but we have a challenge of ensuring that this growth is inclusive, it reaches everyone, but also that it expands freedoms for people. People are no longer interested by impressive numbers. However, they are. It is about, does this expand my freedom? Yeah. And that is true for Asia, for Latin America, and for my own continent. For me, this, I think, is the biggest uh, item on the liability side. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Um, if, if, we, if we could now um, locate this whole uh, debate um, about the competing ideas on, on development. Um, and, and of course, uh, uh, Bedsal and Fukuyama uh, have got a book, and I see uh, Dr. Greenspan has got a copy uh, on the table there, Ideas in Development, New Ideas on Development After the Financial Crisis. Um, do you really think that the management and leadership of global economic affairs uh, has undergone such a radical transformation as to uh, bring out these competing ideas. I know as Secretary General of the Eastern Community, um, whenever I traveled to Europe over the last two years, uh, attending uh, various um, uh, discourses of, of this nature, uh, there is this feeling um, in Europe, and I think in the United States as well, um, that there is a new model uh, of development that, that has emerged. Um, that the Chinese, for example, uh, in terms of their, uh, of their participation uh, in development in Africa, uh, have taken a different kind of a model uh, from the rest of, uh, of, of the world. And, 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 and you hear um, rather negative uh, sentiments, you know, about this Chinese model uh, of supporting African development. Uh, would you say that um, this would constitute uh, one area of competition in terms of what really works best uh, for poor countries. Dr. Greenspan. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I, really, I really think that the whole aid space is changing dramatically. 
First of all, because many of our institutions were built on the north-south paradigm. Uh, you receive money from the north and the rich and developed countries to channel them to the south, and at the same time that you channel money, you channel the solutions from the north to the south. And I think that the, what, what we are living today is that the, we, don't, you, we don't have anymore this very uh, strong division between donor countries and recipient countries. You have countries that are donors and recipients at the same time, that have developing, a, a developing challenges at the same time that have important flows of investment going to the other developing, developing part of the world. China is, is an example, but it's not only China. It's Brazil, and it's India, and it's Turkey, and it's, uh, well, Korea that has joined now that community. So you, we are living in a, in a cooperation space that now have a much more actors in terms of shaping the way in which this partnership is happening. Uh, and I think that this is a very good thing. And when, in, in my experience now with UNDP, when we go to the countries, uh, many of them, what they ask us to do and what we are doing more and more is to bring the solutions of the South to the realities of the South, you know, to the problems of the South. So the South-South, the trilateral cooperation, will be more and more the new fashion in which cooperation will happen in the world. But the second, the second part, in terms of one model, is that I, I am a true believer that you have to go to the countries and work to the countries and what is best for them. That the issue of ownership and countries being in the driver's seat of development is not, on that, is not only a rhetorical, you know, a good political thing to say, but is really key for development to be successful. If we don't do that, if we don't strengthen that part of the equation, so we won't uh, get the results that we are looking for. So when people talk about one model of, uh, or new, <laughs> a new uh, 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 emerging model in cooperation, I really don't think so. I think, as I said at the beginning, that what we have to strengthen is all the models that will work and go to the countries to see and allow them to drive the transformation that they need. And all the uh, successful stories that we are seeing in the world are stories of countries taking in their own hands their development challenges. There, is, it, it, so there are stories about leadership, about national building, about social cohesion. Those are the stories of success that we are uh, seeing. So this idea that it's only one model, the one that is emerging, sometimes I think that it's like an excuse to get around <laughs> some of the things and norms that we need to establish uh, as principles in the development cooperation, you know, to lower the bar in some of the things that we don't want to do. Thank, thank, thank you, Rebecca. We, we are very lucky um, this morning that we do have in the audience uh, uh, President Kofur uh, from Ghana, as well as uh, Deputy Prime Minister Mudavadi uh, from Kenya, who will also, I hope, be able to share with us uh, this uh, particular uh, experience uh, in terms of the Chinese model uh, of, uh, of development and how you know, they are working uh, with African governments. But let me come to Dr. Kaberuka. Uh, from your perspective, um, do, you, do you really think that uh, there is a competing model uh, of development, uh, and particularly in the context of the Chinese, uh, the Turkish, um, uh, as well as Brazilian now, uh, engagement uh, in, in, in Africa? Uh, at, the, uh, at the developmental front, and particularly uh, in infrastructure development? First of all, let me say that uh, there was a time when the so-called Washington Consensus was dominant, and there was a context to that. Uh, we all know 
what are bad policies when we see them. If you see hyperinflation in a country, if you see growth which is not inclusive, you know these are bad policies, wherever. What I think is important to realize is that we don't know what are good policies for any one country. That is what is important. We have now in the G20 a whole range of countries who have come to where we are, they are from different paths. Not simply the Chinese path. You can only talk about China, Juma, but there is also Turkey, there's Malaysia, there's Vietnam, there's Brazil, there are, there's Korea. Different models. Now, they have made their own mistakes. They have learned by doing. And I think at this point, what is important for Africa is not to ask, do you want the Chinese model, the Turkish model, the American model? No. The answer is, here we have a continent of one billion people, uh, rich natural resources, and we'd like to unlock this potential for the good of the world and for the, the good of African people themselves. How best do we do so? Now, you could begin by a set of uh, macroeconomic policies which are standard. We all understand them. Number two, then you have to do a set of sequencing and timing of things you have to do which must be different from country to country. China did not follow the same model as Vietnam uh, or Korea. They follow different paths. And so for me, when you mention infrastructure at this point in time, it is that in the 90s, in the years of the so-called Afro-pessimism, mm -hmm. you remember the days? When they said Africa was lost, uh, the lost decade, the years of uh, transition from one-party state to multi-party state, years of hyperinflation, people said Afro-pessimism. In those days, there was a logic that if you get international aid, you must invest in the social sectors. Mm. So for a decade and a half as a continent, we did not invest in connectivity, in energy, in mass transit, and so on. So today in Africa, whether it is moving food to the market, whether it is uh, connectivity, whether it is infrastructure, the cost of doing business are the highest in the world. Mm. Almost 40% higher than the world. So the Chinese come in and say, look, let's make a deal. You have copper, you have oil, I can do infrastructure for you. This is not Africans adopting a Chinese model, far from it. It is saying, we have a problem, rail, dams, connectivity, you are looking for our oil, let us do a bargain. I don't think there are Africans sitting in this room who are prepared to adopt any model, including the model you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. But there is a problem to be resolved, and at the moment that happens to be mainly infrastructure and the whole issue of integrating our economies. You, you recall Nancy Bedso, I don't know if she's here. Five years ago, she said the whole of Sub Saharan Africa, the size of the economy was equal to Chicago. The city of Chicago. Now, think of the city of Chicago with 46 boundaries, 46 ministers, 46 governments. And so, for us, infrastructure is important to lower the cost of doing business and to integrate our economies. Now, whether we're helped by the tax, the Chinese, the Indians, the Malays, the Americans, so doing, so be it. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me now turn to, um, um, to this broader uh, panel here, uh, you uh, on the floor. Um, would anybody wish to intervene at this stage with a question uh, or um, uh, a view uh, on what uh, we have so far discussed? Um, can I welcome um, uh, some involvement from the floor? Uh, President Kufo, you would like to... Uh, Say something? Yes. <laughs> Do we have mics? Um, yeah, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you've put me on the spot. <laughs> But uh, what uh, Dr. Kabroka said, I thought, answered the question broadly. Um, I don't like the idea of tying development down only to the economy. I believe all the effort should be made to improve the quality of life for the individual a citizen. And uh, while the Econ economic development may be basic. I tell you, uh, if the economic development is not based on good governance, 
governance where the individual has a say on who should govern and when such a person should step down if the person is not delivering with governance. governance. Uh, then I say it's not rounded development. China comes in, China doesn't come in with the communist ideology. In fact, it's clever. It comes in like a contractor. You want to do an infrastructure? I'm ready to do the rail line for you. For pay, I want some of your oil. This is what is happening with China. I don't know if you would call that development model imported from China. So uh, I believe if we are talking of uh, sustainable development into the future, we should take a broad look, a comprehensive look of all the indicators of development and then allow the people seeking development the final say. They should own the plan with which to develop. When we do that, I think the world will be making a really sustainable uh, future. Otherwise, it's going to be lopsided and the, world would, uh, the development matter would remain a football, as uh, Ms. Smith said, among politicians. <laughs> Geopolitics will determine that. That is not too good. Thank you. Thank you, President Kofo. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Mr. The, Chairman. Yes, please. A question. Yes, please. I'm Aidan from Tanzania. There's a certain nervousness about um, Chinese or Asian engagement with Africa. And I'd like to get your perspectives as to why you think that we, and that nervousness I'm detecting from Washington and London and Paris. Why do you two panelists think that might be the case, that the West is nervous about Africa's engagement with, with, the, with the East? Thank you. Thank you, Aidan. Um, nervousness about Chinese uh, um, uh, engagement uh, in Africa. Um, I hope that the, um, the panelists will be able to respond to that. But can I, uh, Professor Sanjay Reddy, you want to share with us uh, um, from your perspective, from the Indian perspective, uh, where is Sanjay? Sanjay Reddy? Um, there is a question? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Bob, yes, please. Bob Berg. Um, there may be different models, but it has been useful to have goals. And the Millennium Development Goals have indeed spurred a number of actions. Uh, the development community really now wonders how you see uh, the process of goals after 2015. What would you like to see uh, as goals for the communities of the world and uh, how can the process be one which, uh, as after all, the last ones occurred because of UN conferences and in their wisdom they, we haven't had so many, but what is the process of involving peoples in the discussions leading to these goals? What, where do you want to see us get to? How do we get to agreement on these? Can I take one more um, question? Uh, Prime Minister Mudavadi, would you like to um, step in and uh, share with us uh, uh, your insights from the Kenyan um, uh, angle? Um, thank you. I, I don't know why you're picking on the politicians, but, <laughs> but I'll try and uh, give it a shot. Now, I think um, one of the issues that we need to perhaps look at is that is China's renewed engagement with um, Africa or the South for that matter useful? I think it is because it is now bringing in a new reawakening uh, from the West, because for quite a while, the West has been disengaging uh, from investment. But speaking from a Kenyan perspective, I've started seeing a re-entry of very many big 
investors who want to look at um, uh, Kenya afresh. So I tend to think there's some positivity here. Yeah. And uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we had the uh, opportunity to host the German uh, chancellor in uh, Nairobi. And a journalist in the audience did ask that um, with this new relationship that is beginning to emerge where China is coming in so forcefully, uh, do you think it's going to harm your relationship uh, with the West? And the response from the Kenyan respondent was very interesting. He said, I think we should move away from the fear of trying to choose friends for Africa. Let Africa have an opportunity to decide who can be their friends, otherwise we'll be reverting to what used to be there in the past. But the issue is, can this friendship be meaningful or not? So I am touching up the issue of somebody talking about objectives and goals here, mm -hmm. that if the relationship and the friendship is going to have a meaningful impact, inspiring, useful development, as aptly described by Kaberuka, then I think we need to look at it. And uh, we are globalizing, so I think this friendship and this latitude must really be led to function. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Prime Minister. Okay. Uh, let me return then to um, um, Rebecca and uh, Donald. Um, I, I, I think uh, three <coughs> fundamental uh, issues have arisen. Um, one is about the governance issue, that really governance is what defines uh, development, uh, good governance in, 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 in particular. Um, and that, um, you know, in terms of the, of the economic uh, or the development model, maybe sometimes we do not look so much at the development, I mean at the, uh, at the governance perspective. And of course one of the major criticisms about Chinese investments or Chinese engagement in Africa uh, is precisely that, um, that, that the, the, there is a sensitivity uh, about do they really care about the state of governance in a particular country uh, where they are, they are, they are involved. Um, um, and, and, and of course this, this is a very large, uh, very large question which I think you might want to uh, respond. Um, but Aidan uh, from Tanzania has also <coughs> raised uh, this whole issue about nervousness. Why, why should there be any nervousness about um, uh, Chinese aid? And Bob uh, has raised a very fundamental question which I was going to raise later, um, uh, which also revolves around um, the economic model uh, for development. And of course, MDGs uh, were seen uh, in that particular context uh, that unless you are able to address uh, these particular uh, development challenges, uh, you might not be able to have the kind of economic growth uh, that you need uh, to sustain uh, um, the, 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 the economy uh, of a country. Uh, so, can I, um, Kaberuka, can you respond to some of these perspectives that have come from the floor? Sure. Yes. Uh, I don't know if there's nervousness about China. Uh, I don't know, because the whole world is investing in China. China is the biggest buyer of U.S. Uh, treasuries. So I think, be it Europe or the U.S. or Africa, the whole world is doing business uh, with China. And for me, that's not a sign of nervousness. Uh, it's a relationship to be managed. But I would like to add the following. In 1980, uh, you and I had left the University of Germany. 80% of China's people were rural peasants. 80% were rural peasants. Today is an economic power. In that, people look at, wonder, how do they do it? India in the 1980s was the biggest recipient of foreign aid. Now it is a giver of aid. Vietnam, now a $300 billion economy, with only 10% of its people uh, below poverty line. So there are things here which people are looking at with interest. What is happening? What can we learn? from those experiences. So that's the first thing. Number two, uh, I would like to link your two questions of MDGs and governance. Mm -hmm. 
I think MDGs, uh, when they were adopted, they were really the best in terms of advocacy. It was the best, what humankind could do to advocate for the best by 2015. But I think there was a critical mistake we made, which we must now accept. I think we predicated too much the achievements of Millennium Development Goals on foreign aid. Uh -huh. Then MDGs will be achieved if the international community does a whole set of things. Double aid, aid effectiveness, and the whole rest of it. Now we know by 2015, only a couple of countries will be achieving MDGs. It will be patchy, some will, others won't. Now we know that the best way to make progress towards MDGs is by economic growth. That is resilient, that is inclusive. And that requires what? Investment. And investors are coming to Africa, this is what they tell me, and they are coming in large numbers. In large numbers. They are looking for they know it will take time to do infrastructure. They know that. In fact, some of them want to work with us on issues of energy. They see opportunities. But they're looking for stability. They're looking for rule of law. They're looking for institutions that work for everybody. They're looking for a private sector which is not based by on privileges, but on competition. Now, call that governance, that's it. And that is the governance which enables investors, both Africans and non-Africans, to invest to put their risky capital on the table. And so for me, I link the whole area of governance, sound institutions, investment, and of course, the possibility of getting to the Millennium Development Goals. It is not an objective in itself, although as uh, President Kufo says, it is quite important that you expand human freedom, human horizons, as you increase economic growth. But for me, I think sound institutions, sound governance are related to the need to increase investment on the continent, to create confidence for investors, for Africans, for the diaspora. This is how I would like to, to link uh, the three. Yeah. Rebecca? Yes, uh, I think that there, uh, uh, Donna has said something very important, that is that we need to bring back to the discussion of development the economic perspective. In a way, you know, the MDGs that were so important, I think that they were the best we could do in 2000, and that's why so much has been achieved, and many of them, even if all countries won't achieve all of them, but a lot of progress has been made. But one of the things that were lacking in the MDGs was the economic perspective. We have uh, emptied the discussion about development from economics, and I think that we need to get back that on track. It has happened the same with the human development paradigm, that they, at the beginning had a, such an important discussion about the economic options that makes human development possible and sustainable. And we, we started to discuss much more what I will call like the pre-market conditions. And we uh, sided, marginalized the discussion of what happens in the market for economic growth to be inclusive and sustainable. So I think that that is very important. But a word of caution, that is that I'm seeing again this tendency to talk about growth with no adjectives. You know, growth again being the solution to all social problems and all governance problems. And we know that that's not the case. We know that we can have growth with exclusion. We know that we can have growth with economic and political exclusion. We know that. So I think that it's very important when we think about the agenda for the post-2015 uh, uh, period that we will talk about inclusive and sustainable growth in a meaningful way. Not all growth will bring about the sustainability of the agenda that we invested so much on, on the MDGs. That's my, my first point. Let's, let's be careful, because I see a restructuring of the discourse again, you know, trying to put only growth at the center of the agenda with no other considerations. And growth will be, again, uh, whatever growth will be, you know, pro-poor and uh, pro MDGs and etc. And we know that that's not the case. That you need to make uh, to intervene and make the right policy choices for growth to be inclusive and bring the voice and the vulnerable groups into the table. That's my first point. That has a relation 
in, in the post-MDG agenda with two things that in the international assessment that we made about uh, MDGs and what were the bottlenecks, I want to bring into the table. One of them is that in many of the countries, for growth to be inclusive, the rural development and agricultural agenda mm -hmm. has to be brought back very forcefully in terms of policy. Uh, the agricultural sector and the smallholders part of it have been left out of the investment and the care of the, of the policies and a lot in terms also of investment in the international community. So to bring back the issue of rural development, of agriculture, I think that is key. And so when we talk about investment, that I totally agree with Donna, when we talk about investment, I think that it's very important to talk about the investment that also will be inclusive, because we can make big roads and high bridges and uh, big dams, and we cannot, and, and it may happen that again, we don't bring the water and the road that will make rural development possible and will bring those vulnerable groups into the mainstream of development. So I, I want, my second point is, Yes, it's again growth, investment, and everything, but for growth to be inclusive, and let me make this point, uh, uh, that many times is only like, at the end, econo economic empowerment of women is key. Mm -hmm. Economic empowerment of women is key. And that doesn't happen alone. It needs a set of policies and rules and laws that will unleash the potential of women to be a, a, a very important partner of development. And my last point is the energy agenda. We have more than 1.4 billion people that are energy poor. So in thinking about the post-2015 agenda, the linkage between poverty, energy, and environment has to be a very important one. You know, if we don't give access or a, a energy access to the poor in the world uh, that are lacking the minimum of th that is required to make it happen. You know, productivity suffers, etc. But we can do that in an unsustainable way or in a sustainable way. And the sol solving the energy question in terms of making energy accessible, but also the a solutions being sustainable in terms of climate change and the environment will be a centerpiece, I think, of the discussions for the, 20, the post-2015 thank, thank agenda. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rebecca. I was going to come back to you, uh, Rebecca, uh, later uh, to uh, share with us the uh, Latin American experience. Um, I hope we'll have um, uh, a bit of time to do that uh, because I think some of the fundamental points which you have raised about growth, growth uh, without inclusion uh, and marginalization, the inequalities uh, that are emerging, the, the encroachment uh, into, the, into the ecological balance uh, in Latin America um, seems to, 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 to reflect poorly uh, on the kind of transformation uh, and the miracle that is happening in Latin America. Uh, but we'll come back to that point. Uh, but Donald, uh, now you have been uh, one of the um, uh, leading uh, painters of a very rosy uh, picture about an African resurgence. Um, and I know that McKinsey uh, consulting firm uh, has brought out a number of uh, writings during the last year uh, showing um, uh, or reflecting on the roaring uh, African lion. Um, and of course, you participated uh, in some of that uh, literature. But, but I know uh, that you're a leading advocate of the view uh, that is, this is, to quote uh, President Obama, uh, that this is Africa's moment, uh, that Africa is ready uh, to scale up uh, development, uh, and you see um, some very key uh, underlying factors that support uh, the resurgence of Africa. Can you share with us uh, your perspectives 
uh, on why you have this very optimistic picture uh, about a new uh, resurgent Africa. Thank you very much. I'm glad that President Kufo is here. Uh, uh, please, President, forgive me for what I'm going to say. Uh, uh, in 1960, people like to say to compare Ghana with the Korea. You have heard this before. In 1981, I visited Ghana, and I found a complete economic breakdown because of the military who in power and uh, economic mismanagement. And then the Ghanaians emerged, uh, began on a long uh, haul of economic reforms, which they completed uh, sometime in the 90s. And then they began uh, political reforms under uh, President Kufo. Now Ghana is on the way to become a middle-income country. They've just reversed their GDP. Uh, they're on the way to become a middle-income country, which, of course, they should, be, should have been a long time ago. On condition, and these are the following conditions, that a stability continues to rule in that country, that institutions continue to be stable, that they resolve the issues of infrastructure, which they are trying to do, but above all, that Ghana manages well its newly found oil wealth. Because for me, these are the critical issues around an agenda which can reinforce what you found in McKinsey. McKinsey did not see, say anything we didn't know before, that basically from around 2000, Africa has created a new momentum, which in my judgment cannot be stopped, because it is underlined by the demographic changes, urbanization, and so many things. A young population, a, a small but rising middle class with a large uh, discretionary income. Now, those are facts on the ground, but the risks which I'm mentioning are real. The risks are real, that in the political arena, managing natural resources, and of course, resolving the issues of infrastructure. But I want to tell my friends who are here that things are happening in Africa, which maybe, uh, for those of you who don't deal with Africa on a day-to-day -day basis, you wouldn't see. But I'm head of a bank, and I see investors from all over the world coming to us, saying to us, look, we don't understand Africa's risk. Can you go in there with us? And I'm talking about billions of money every year, equity funds and other investors. And so I'm encouraged. And by the way, uh, today, if you're looking at the Greek bonds, which have been now downgraded to junk bonds, or some other European countries in the periphery, and you compare to African assets, you can make the difference. I think now the African risk, which has been overestimated in the past, is being judged at its right level. Mm -hmm. So I think we're on the right path. We have many problems we have to resolve. Inclusive growth is one of them. Managing natural resources, avoiding the Dutch disease, ensuring that we govern for all, and the issues which Dr. Greenspan was mentioning about uh, the environment and the rest of it. But I'm confident about where we're going. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I again um, bring in uh, the rest of the uh, participants here to uh, share their uh, insights? Uh, anybody with a burning uh, uh, question? Yes, please. Yes. I have uh, two questions, or actually three, on different topics. Uh, one is from Mr. Kabaruka on the Chinese in Africa. And uh, you also mentioned uh, the famine in the Horn of Africa. And I understand it's good for African countries to have um, more of an option in uh, who they deal with as foreign friends. But at the same time, we also see that large pieces of lands are being leased out for the Chinese to uh, grow their own products or to grow plants for biofuels. And uh, if you say that the famine in uh, the Horn of Africa was human-made, hasn't that also got to do with the way we are promoting economic growth and also the way uh, Africa deals with China in making large um, um, projects that support economic growth? There are also projects of Dutch investors, because I'm from Holland, uh, doing agribusiness in Africa, but it's not necessarily good for the, the small-scale farmers or the, or the herdsmen who are being pushed aside. So that was my first question. On, I don't think it's a nervousness from the Western donors. I think it's more uh, also um, a concern for ordinary people and inclusive growth. 
And my second question to you would be, um, to what extent do African countries um, take into account the demographic changes and the fact that there are so many young people in uh, Africa? And do you think that that is an opportunity or do you think that that is a risk for the development of Africa? And my third question would be to Ms. Greenspan. Because she said that um, the MDGs leave out the economic theory, which is true. But at the same time, the MDGs came in because uh, they were a response to the structural adjustment programs. And if I read the literature, then I still fear that a lot of the poverty uh, reduction strategy papers of the World Bank um, are still emphasizing structural adjustments and not always emphasizing MDGs. So there is lip service to pro-poor and there is lip service to social sectors as if we can separate that from economic growth, as if you know, the private sector doesn't need healthy uh, people that are educated to work for them. So, Thank you. I think that's enough. That's Thank enough. you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I'm allowed to ask a fourth question, but it fits in well with the youth. To me, the lesson uh, of Tunisia uh, is not just inclusive growth and all that. It's youth, unemployment, and frustrated resentments at growing inequality. And I'd love to hear from both our panelists, do they think that is a problem? Is it one which now needs to be tackled what can be done, and if it's not done, are the growing number of billionaires and big money interests going to prevent the democracy to tackle those issues? Thank you. Uh, one, y yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Mohammed Hassan. I I am co-chair of the Inter-Academy Panels Network of Academies of Science Worldwide. I was also former executive director of TWAS, the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World. And I just want to bring in um, the voice of the scientific and technological community in development, which has been so far quite absent from the discussion. And. Um, and we all know and understand that without proper investment in science, technology, and education, there will be no sustainable growth. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the key problems facing the poor countries, and especially Africa. Proper investment in education, especially quality education in science and technology. And I was, uh, by the way, uh, President uh, Kabiruka in Lisbon, uh, uh, attending the annual meeting of the African Development Bank, and I was very delighted that for the first time the African Development Bank is having a strategy uh, dealing with higher education, science, and technology investment in Africa. And my question is can you highlight some of the key issues raised in this strategy and how the African Development Bank is aiming to implement it? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That was a very interesting question. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> You're uh, very strategic. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Brawl from Canada, and I'm with the SID Governing Council. Uh, and my question is uh, directed to um, Mr. Kabaruka, and it's the uh, in the context of the role of leadership in development in Africa. Uh, clearly, throughout Africa's history, and even into the present day, we've seen shining examples of good leadership and the impact that that has had. A um, number of examples, Amadou Toure, Theodore Senghor, Nelson Mandela, Julius Nyerere, and Paul Kagame. I had the uh, privilege of uh, visiting uh, Rwanda last December, and I was quite impressed with what I saw as genuine um, progress in light of the tragic past. So what I'd like to know uh, from your perspective is in all that we've discussed so far, uh, the extent to which leadership is important and what is your sort of prognosis for the future and the role that leadership will continue to play in uh, development. Thank you. Yeah, um, may, maybe we start with uh, uh, Dr. Greenspan, um, because when you talk about uh, a role of leadership, um, uh, Brazil, for example, uh, has seen uh, that kind of remarkable leadership uh, with uh, Lula uh, over the last few years. We'll come to the African dimension 
Um, but really, uh, if um, the principal you could give us very quickly uh, perspective on the uh, economic transformation that is taking place uh, in Latin America, um, and yet you know you do have these clashes, um, uh, erosions into the into the success uh, in terms of the emerging inequalities, uh, in terms of the um, of the uh, of the uh, environmental uh, uh, concerns uh, that go uh, with this kind of development, and of course then you can also respond uh, to the questions of uh, uh, of education because talking to my friend um, uh, Professor Calestus Juma, who was Kenyan teaching at uh, Harvard um, Kennedy School uh, of Government, uh, his doctorate thesis was from Brazil. Um, and he raises some very fundamental issues uh, regarding the role of science and technology uh, in bringing about um, uh, social and economic transformation uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the developing world, really underscoring the importance uh, of, uh, of education. And I think Abiruka would also uh, like to respond to that question. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juma. Let, let me first clarify, because if, if I get the impression that the lady that uh, made the question has, I want to clarify that. I think that the MDGs were great, and we, we could, if we didn't do it, we should have to invent it. You know, I think that uh, the agenda of the MDGs is great. What I think is that the targets that were a, a, the device to a track progress were less less than the Millennium Declaration. The Millennium Declaration was more than the MDG targets and goals. And in the goals, the play of economic reality should have been much more brought in. Because if not, you have like these two different agendas, one for economic growth and one for the MDGs. And I think that we need to bring them together, but not forgetting the MDGs <laughs> is precisely bringing the MDGs to the center of the, the economic policies of the, of the countries. That, that, that was my point, so I, I totally agree with her. Now, in Latin America, let me say first that the main, the, 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 the main factor also that sometimes we forget for the transformation of Latin America is that democracy came to Latin America big time you know, after the 80s. So you have in Latin America a very strong democratic a continent where in the framework of democracy, many of the policies for more equality and redistribution came about because within democracy, the voice really of the people was heard much more for education and health improvements and for policy interventions that made the economy grow in a more equitable way. So when you look at all the studies that have been done about Latin America, not only about economic growth, but about the declining of inequality, the, uh, the, the, the conclusion is that inequality was falling, not because it was a natural thing that will happen anyway, but because of the intervention of the state with the right public policy for that to happen. So my first point is democracy is a, is a big part of the success of Latin America. It's not a small part of the success of Latin America. The expansion of education during these 20 years is the second major factor. And the third factor, as I said before, is that within macroeconomic macroeconomic sound policies and financial policies that we learned very hard from the, our crisis in the 80s. Policies for more equitable growth, as I say, were introduced. And they are of two types. On the one hand, the transfer of resources to the poor via pensions in the rural sectors, via conditional cash transfers, were very well designed were designed in a way that was, for the first time in Latin America, away from a clientelistic uh, type of capture by the interests, uh, by the different interests. And uh, there were massive 
100 million people in Latin America are today under some kind of cash transfer or conditional cash transfer uh, schemes. But the second intervention that is less studied and less cited in the literature was the intervention in the labor market and the regulation for minimum wages and for increased real wages in, uh, uh, in the labor market. And that part has been cited a little bit by the literature and it has been a very important part of the success. Just two, two points left in terms of the challenges that coincide with what some of you have said in, in the questions. One is that the youth challenge in Latin America is also huge. Let me give you only one, one number. A, one of every four young people in the region is not studying and not working. If that's not exclusion, I don't know how, what exclusion is. <laughs> you know, you have 25% of the young between 15 and 24 years old that are out of the labor market and out of the education system. And it's a huge a problem for the region and one that will need much more effort to be solved and be tackled. By the second one is that we have to avoid the middle income trap. And part of avoiding the middle income trap is precisely the issue about science and technology is to come to uh, an agenda of knowledge, science, and technology investment. And Latin America is really behind Asia in the investment in science and technology, and something that goes with it, that is to go beyond the expansion of education, of basic education, and to go to the next step, that is the expansion of tertiary education for the science and technology a, 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 a agenda to be helpful. Thank, thank, you, thank you, thank you, Rebecca. Um, um, Donald, um, there's been a question about um, the food insecurity and how we manage uh, you know, climate change, particularly in the context of what you mentioned about the drought uh, in the Horn of Africa and coming all the way down to northern Kenya. Uh, but also there's been the question about the, the demographic transition. Uh, I know that in your current uh, uh, economic outlook report, uh, you do make uh, uh, a great deal of reference to the youth budget uh, and the, the impact that it might have on social stability uh, in, in, in Africa. And of course, that is also uh, related to your personal education. Give us your perspective on some of these issues. Thank you, sir. But could I begin with the question of leadership? Le leadership and development. You know, there is a famous French writer who said, uh, you, would you prefer a sheep leading lions or a lion leading sheep? Uh, uh, I'm not sure that I understood the context. <laughs> leadership. <laughs> leadership is important. It's even decisive. But the critical factor is institutions. Because leadership, uh, is something which is within a human person. And a human being can go to very good, to very bad. Or the other way around. We have seen leaders who have started off on a very good path for their countries. <laughs> and maybe because of a staying in power or some other reasons, they go very, very bad. Because the institutions were weak. And so for me, I think it is critically important to have leadership, but even more important to have strong institutions which are a function. I think for me, this is where I stand. You can then decide whether the sheep leading lions or lions leading sheep. But I think for me, institutions are critical. Number two, on China and Africa's natural resources. I agree. It is important that Africans decide how to manage their natural resources because natural resources are depletable. They are exhaustible. So whether you are trading with Asia or the Americas or Europe, these are resources which become, uh, would be exhausted at some point. So we must use those resources to build an industrial base, to build a productive base, 
which ensures sustainability in the long term. I think that we should avoid a mistake made in the 60s and 70s of simply being exporters of this product. Now, that applies in respect of who the buyer is. I agree that in many countries on my continent, you have uh, oil exporting countries who are 70% of the people living in the middle of the poverty line. And that is completely unacceptable. It is important that the oil economy feeds into a productive uh, capacity for the country, does not damage agriculture, and the rest of it. That is, I think, uh, orthodox. Now, on the farming and food security, I really want to be clear on this. Amatya Sen said this many years ago, writing about uh, Bangladesh and India on the farmers. He said the problem was not showing your food as such, it was showing you what he called entitlement. In other words, a group of people like to purchase the power because the animals have died or some other issues to purchase food is developed. The failure of policy in the Horn of Africa is about A, managing the small crisis. This is the longest crisis on the African continent, 20 years. So that is the first failure. And it's the first failure of African leaders ourselves, all of us included. And this is the beginning point. How do we resolve the issue of smart food? Number two, how do we have a long-term plan for this delicate ecosystem which is in the market? And that is not a rocket science. We are prepared now to work with IGAD. The head of IGAD came to see me uh, two weeks back. We are trying to work with the other international institutions to look at the whole uh, long-term plan for the area. But it supposes that the smart crisis uh, is what trend. I was asking an issue about uh, uh, Land grabs, land grabs, i.e., countries coming to grow food for their own people on African soil, as opposed to investing in Africa for the market, including the domestic market, which is very different. I think investing in African agribusiness is something we must absolutely work because that is being done already in terms of flowers, coffee, tea, and the rest of it. So why not maize and rice? But actually, coming to lease African land to export food outside Africa, that is problematic. Because at the end of it, actually what you are leasing is not land, you are leasing water, which in the future could be an issue. And so there is a summit uh, in Lusaka in October, organized by the African Union, ourselves, and the Economic Commission for Africa to look at the best practices for these kind of relationships. And those best practices uh, exist. And I hope we can find a ways in which we can encourage investments in farming, at the same time ensuring the interests of African farmers for now in the future, their interests are taken uh, into account. What about the youth? Uh, 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 the youth, yes. Uh, the youth, uh, I want to disagree with uh, uh, my brother who said uh, that Tunisia was simply about inequality, it was more than that. Tunisia was a failure, I think the perfect failure, of this model of what I call authoritarian buggy model. That is to say, we'll give you education, social services, even jobs, as long as we keep quiet on the democratic side. Now, that was okay for some time, but the youth educated and denied internet could not go on for long. Did you see the president of Tunisia the night before he left power, the last thing he did was to free internet for the people. But how do you educate the people and deny them access to knowledge? So for me, I think the failure of this authoritarian model was the biggest failure. The rest followed inequalities, exclusion, uh, regional disparities, and so on. And I think now, uh, in the Arab Spring, artists in Tunisia are trying to resolve all those issues, and we are encouraging them, we are part of the financial package for the post-evolution recovery in Nigeria. Thank you very much indeed. I'm not really going to sum up. We're left with uh, two and a half minutes. Um, what I'm going to do um, is really to ask for your last word. Uh, so, Greenspan, give us your last word uh, in terms of what you think uh, the SID, Society for International Development, um, should really learn um, um, in terms of the current development thinking. And I know that, is, that there are competing ideas and competing models, 
uh, and SID is now in search uh, of, a, of, a, of a clearer path uh, in terms of its uh, thrust, in terms of its impulse. What, what would you be your advice to the site of international development uh, in terms of its uh, development uh, uh, thinking? Well, I, I would say that the, the seed has been an enormous source of ideas and evidence-based uh, research that has to continue to, to drive the discussion and development. Development is about discussing different alternatives, about opening up the options, and I think that the role that the societies like it can play in that field is enormous, and we should avoid to go back to a discourse that thinks that have the answers for everything, you know, and that there is only one way of doing things and, and, and play a role on, on that arena as you have played always since you exist is, uh, is, is my major, yeah, major aspiration. But can I, can I say only one thing yeah, yes, for today? Because uh, this is something that Kabaruka brought at the beginning, but let me say that in, the, in discussing development, let's not forget the help that Somalia and the Horn of Africa needs today. If we continue about to, 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 talk, to talk about development, but we fail in saving the children and mothers that are suffering today in Somalia, it will be a huge failure for the whole development community. And my, my, my last thought is let's never forget that the short and the long term start at the same time. So at the same time that we help Somalia to get over this crisis, let's think how to avoid the crisis for the future, for this never to happen again. Okay, there is the immediate humanitarian need, and I think Rebecca, you are appealing uh, to support from the, this congregation. Uh, so I think we should show our support uh, to the humanitarian cause uh, in, uh, in Somalia uh, and the rest of the Horn of Africa. So those who are able to contribute uh, something, please, uh, I hope that the SID Secretariat uh, can, uh, can do this. Uh, this is an appeal that is coming from Rebecca, and I totally endorse it. Uh, last word, uh, Donna, uh, from you, and particularly advice to the Society of International Development. How do you really see SID moving forward, uh, playing a frontal role uh, in this um, um, uh, dynamic, this uh, development thinking uh, dynamic that we're experiencing today? Thank you very much, Juman. But first of all, to enforce uh, what uh, Dr. Griezmann says, I think it's only made sure of uh, the horn. It's not simply about giving food to the, to the small children. That is important. We now have to save lives in the horn. But you know, this crisis has not come as a tsunami. It has not come as a surprise. We have known about this crisis for the last six months. This is not the first time it has happened in the horn. And I don't think it is the last time it will happen. I think the best contribution we make today is to say, let us save lives in the horn. But let us work together for the stability and ensuring that the Horn of Africa does not see this tragedy in the coming years. And that begins by a political action by African people themselves on Somalia. This is the longest crisis on the African continent. And I think it has begun with us resolving that issue. That's the first point. Number two, I think uh, I see my friend Bob Zorja so I leave him to develop that later. Someone has said over the last 30 years that to measure events which have redefined the world. The collapse of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Lehman Brothers. And as in between, the world is quite different. And so the Society for International Development has had an agenda over this period of time, which is absolutely fantastic. I think we have done a great job in terms of advocacy for what the world could do for Africa. That was the problem. It was, what can we do for Africa? I think the new terrain is saying two things. First of all, it is unlikely that the rich world suffering fiscal retrenchment, unemployment, can it generate the resources we need for the kind of investment we have to make. But there is a new terrain which gives the whole architecture possibilities. And I think the new agenda for the SID could be how do we get Africa to converge with the rest of the world, to 
unlock its own potential. Taking advantage of all these possibilities now which are open in the world, which are domestic, which are regional, which are international. I think in that agenda you find Africans working with you instead of the international community doing something uh, for the Africans. And you'll find that it's an agenda which should be uh, most welcome on my continent. Again, I want to end by saying that uh, what happens on my continent in terms of sustainability we largely depend upon what we do with Africans. Rule of law, stable institutions, institutions that work for all, creating confidence for investors, African investors, and foreign investors. And I welcome you to be announced in that agenda. Thank you very much indeed. Know your clap, but can we now formally give a huge clap to our two panelists for?